with you. At home or in the sanctuary, we welcome you to worship with Trinity Reformed Church. We are a community God gathers, transforms, and sends to share Christ's expansive love with the world. If you're new to Trinity, we invite you to fill out a welcome card so that we can get to know you and share a little bit about what's happening in our lives together. You can find those welcome cards in the Bibles by your seats, or if you're worshiping with us online, you can send an email to Ben or I to introduce yourself so that we can connect with you as well. We have a few announcements in our life together that we want to highlight this morning. After worship this morning, Trinity members are invited to head downstairs to the basement fellowship hall for a congregational meeting. We're going to elect a new slate of elders and deacons and also brainstorm ways that Trinity can live into our vision and values in the coming year. During that time after worship, children are invited to head downstairs to the youth room, which is in the other building across the way, and they'll be watching a video together while we have our congregational meeting. Also, on this Palm Sunday, we begin our Holy Week journey to the cross and the empty tomb. So we have some things we want to remind you about this week. You're invited to join us for worship on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary or online via Zoom for our Monday, Thursday Tenebrae worship. That's a service of communion and hand washing, scripture, music, and prayer on Thursday at 7 p.m. And then next Sunday, we'll be having our Easter worship here in the sanctuary together. And you are invited next Sunday to bring your bells. If you have bells, we'll have some bells here, but it's always nice to have a little more bell, more cowbell maybe. Um, so bring your bells with you next Sunday, or we'll have some here as well. I think that's all my announcements. So I invite you to turn to your purple insert in your bulletin, and we'll sing our intro song, Thirst No More.
I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our call to worship. It is holy to gather. It is holy to sing. It is holy to be generous, to throw our coats on the road. It is holy to celebrate justice when we see it. It is holy to shout Hosanna. It is holy to remember. It is holy to gather. It is holy to sing. Here and now, as the people of God, let us worship together, singing number 146 in our red hymnals, all glory, laud, and honor. And you are invited to wave your palm branches as we sing. in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and will come again, and all God's people said, amen. I invite you to be seated. The word Hosanna is often sung with joy and glee on this day. 
we parade and we wave our palm branches and it feels like a celebration. And that is good because it is. And the word Hosanna actually means save us. The people along that parade route so many years ago were crying out to Jesus for help because they knew that this world is not as it should be. In the prayer of confession, we have our own Hosanna moment. We cry out to God, admitting the ways in which we have fallen short and asking for God's saving help. So let us pray together now, trusting in the love and power of God to save us. God of parades and Hosannas, you have called us to speak the truth, to speak out against oppression, to speak up for love, to speak hope to fear, but so often we are silent. We worry that we'll say the wrong thing, so we don't say anything at all. We worry that we'll offend, so we keep our convictions to ourselves. We worry that we'll speak up and won't be heard, so we stay silent. And meanwhile, the parade marches on. Unravel our fears, spark conviction in us. Give us the courage to shout, Hosanna, amen. Having confessed our sin, hear this good news from the prophet Isaiah. It is the Lord who helps us. So who will declare us guilty? Because of the grace we have received, we have nothing to fear. Siblings in Christ, listen, believe, and proclaim the good news. God's love is overflowing. We are drenched in mercy. Thanks be to God. And having been forgiven in Christ, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share Christ's peace together. Good morning, friends. 
Will you help me sing our prayer for illumination? Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here. I have something in my basket here. It's kind of heavy. What do you think might be in here? Asher? Hand sanitizer, that's a good guess. We've got that everywhere. Oh yeah, <laughs> that was a great guess. Any other guesses? Candy, oh, that would have been good. Emma, a rock. Listen to what it sounds like. Esther? Beads, that's a good guess. Jonah? Marbles, oh, that's a good guess too. Emma was really close. It's not just one rock, a basket of rocks. And can you see what's on these rocks? A palm branch. Hetty, do you want to carry the basket around and let everybody choose a rock? Oh. <laughs> Very heavy. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm going to leave these rocks in the children's resource area. So if you didn't come up and you would like one, you can get one later. All right, take your rock and hold it up to your ear. What do you hear? You don't hear anything? <laughs> Nothing. Do you normally hear something when you put a rock to your ear? No. Right. <laughs> oh, that's true. We do hear from seashells. I'm going to talk to you today about some special rocks. So what special holiday are we celebrating today? Asher, uh, Palm Sunday, yep, Easter's next week. When we remember how Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on a, what did he ride in on? Donkey. A donkey, yeah. The crowd saw Jesus coming and they spread out their coats and blankets on the road to make a soft path. And then they cut palm branches like we wave today, right? And waved them as Jesus and shouted as Jesus approached. They shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now there were some Pharisees in the crowd. They were very proper people who were quite proud of themselves. And these Pharisees said to Jesus, you should control your followers. Tell them to stop shouting and cheering for you like that. And do you know what Jesus said to them? He said, if the people kept quiet, the very stones along this road would burst into tears. Wouldn't that be something? Can you imagine if one of the rocks that you have started cheering and shouting, hooray for Jesus? <laughs> Thank you, Hattie. Did any of you hear your rock shouting this morning? No, we didn't, did we? The rocks were very quiet, weren't they? Now, remember, Jesus said, if the people kept quiet and didn't praise the Lord, that the stones would cheer. But the people didn't keep quiet, did they? Do you remember what they said and what they did? What was the special word that they shouted? Esther. Hosanna, yep. Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Can you say that with me? Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. All right, now can you shout it? Ready? Hosanna! Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Good job, guys. Even today, we aren't keeping quiet about Jesus, are we? We praise Jesus every Sunday in church. We tell our friends about Jesus, and we sing songs about Jesus. But it's not just us here at Trinity. There are people all over the world praising Jesus and waving their palm branches today and saying, Hosanna! Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, your little rocks have palm branches on them, right? So you have a choice today. You can bring your rock home, put it somewhere in your room to help you remember the story of Palm Sunday, 
or you can find somewhere outside to hide your rock so that someone else can find it and think about Palm Sunday. Will you guys pray with me, please? That's a good idea. Well, that is a beautiful color. All right. Will you guys pray with me, please? Dear Jesus, we thank you and worship you, Lord Jesus. You are our king, and we want to shout your praises. Amen. Our song of preparation is Prepare the Way of the Lord. We can find that in our red books, number 58. Our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 118, read verses 1 through 2 and 19 through 29, and that's on page 492 in our Sanctuary Bibles. Listen for the word of God. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And our second reading is from Luke 19. We'll read verses 28 through 40. And that's on page 854 in our Sanctuary Bibles. Listen for the word of God. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, 
The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. In George R.R. Martin's series, Game of Thrones, a counselor poses a grisly riddle about power. In a room sit three great men a king, a priest, and a rich man with his gold. Between them stands a sellsword, a little man of common birth and no great mind. Each of the great ones bids him slay the other two. Do it, says the king, for I am your lawful ruler. Do it, says the priest, for I command you in the name of the gods. Do it, says the rich man, and all this gold shall be yours. So tell me, who lives and who dies? Who has the power? With the invasion of Ukraine, many of us have been thinking anew about the riddle of power, especially the power of violence. So has Erica Chenoweth, who studies political violence and its alternatives at Harvard Kennedy School. Genoa's studies began with the intuition that war is awful, but inevitable, that violence is always the most powerful strategy. But it wasn't long before Genoa discovered the counterintuitive reality that nonviolent citizen-led movements can act- are actually more effective at creating revolutionary change than violent insurrections. Certainly, some nonviolent movements fail and some violent insurrections succeed, but Chenoweth analyzed historical data for over 100 years from every part of the world and found that nonviolent movements are twice as effective at creating revolutionary change. On Trinity's website, there's a link to the the Hidden Brain episode that features Chenoweth's work, so you can dig into the details if you want. Now, these nonviolent movements are not passive. They are provocative. People risk suffering, arrest, and worse, all in an effort to goad authorities into overreacting. Their goal is to turn the neutral masses to their side. An example from Serbia. A group working to remove Slobodan Milosevic painted an image of Milosevic's face on a big metal barrel. They put the barrel in front of the National Theater and invited regular people passing by to pay a token amount of money to hit the barrel with a bat. People formed a long line to whack the barrel. Then the police showed up. But what could they do? Arrest the shoppers with their children for hitting a barrel? Ridiculous. But do nothing and allow the president's image to be defiled? Impossible. The officers decided to drag the mild-mannered barrel bashers away, but photographers from the resistance group were in place and ready to record the moment. They published photos of all those respectable, regular people being hauled away with the smashed face of Milosevic on the barrel framed in the background. Another example. In Morocco, it was illegal to fly the colors of the flag for the independence movement there. A group of protesters announced they were going to organize an illegal flag flying protest anyway. They publicized the time and location and made sure the authorities knew all about it. At the appointed time, the authorities were there in force, ready to arrest anyone displaying the flag's colors. But none of the protesters showed up waving flags. 
Instead, from all sides of that crowded area, they discreetly released stray cats who had little independence flags tied to their tails. <laughs> Troopers in full riot gear were forced to herd cats lunging at them as they went up and down narrow alleys. It's quite a scene. None of the protesters were arrested that day. Now, humor pokes at the invincibility myth of an autocratic regime. Chenoweth says these campaigns open people's minds to the possibility of a new future. The key is creating what is called an act, a dilemma action. A dilemma action confronts authorities with a lose-lose situation. Do they ignore the small, ridiculous annoyance? Or do they look silly hauling away an empty barrel or chasing a stray cat? Chenoweth's research gives us insight into the riddle of what Jesus is trying to accomplish in riding a donkey toward Jerusalem. Jesus has been to Jerusalem before, but this time it's clearly different. It's Passover, the season of remembering Israel's exodus from Egypt and deliverance from slavery. Bursting with pilgrims and intoxicated with nationalistic fervor, Jerusalem has a tendency to be unruly during Passover. So Roman governors make it a habit to parade into town at the start of the festival to remind folks who is in charge, who has the power. Pontius Pilate makes the trip from his lovely seaside palace in Caesarea Maritima. Coming from the northwest, Pilate probably parades into the city's western gate. Picture Pilate on a regal horse, surrounded by Roman soldiers marching in formation, spear tips and swords glinting in sunlight. More discreet, plainclothes guards circulate through the throngs lining the street, looking for troublemakers. Pilate parades into Jerusalem with the power of threatened violence. Jesus approaches Jerusalem from the east, coming from Jericho and traveling through the working class suburbs of Bethphage and Bethany. Before descending the Mount of Olives, which is right across the Kidron Valley from the temple side of Jerusalem, Jesus commandeers a donkey. Now, Jesus has made it all the miles from Jericho on foot. Why ride a donkey down the Mount of Olives at the very end now? Why parade to Jerusalem at all? The Gospel of Luke is clear that Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus tells the disciples he intends to accomplish everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets. Jesus is going to be handed over to the Gentiles, to be mocked, insulted, and spat upon, to be flogged and killed, and on the third day, to rise again. Jesus' whole plan is set in motion by riding a donkey down the Mount of Olives. On that donkey, that symbol of a ruler coming in peace, Jesus creates a dilemma action for the Romans and for the religious leaders. Anyone parading into Jerusalem, even on a donkey, is claiming to be the rightful ruler. Jesus is intentionally provoking the authorities and confronting them with a lose-lose situation. On the one hand, they cannot allow Jesus to undermine Roman rule. Jesus is making fun of Pilate's parade and Rome's power. On the other hand, they cannot look foolish worrying about the kingly claims of an unarmed man with no army entering the city with his toes dragging from a donkey. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem challenges people to ask, who really has power here? The Romans and religious leaders bide their time. They know the crowd of poor people following Jesus from Bethphage and Bethany down the mount have power while that crowd holds together. The authorities will wait until Thursday night this week when it's dark and Jesus is alone with his disciples. Then they will arrest and mistreat Jesus. Then they will put on a show trial and torture Jesus. Then they will place Jesus on a cross 
and show the world the ridiculousness of Jesus' claims, the emptiness of Jesus' teachings, the nonsense of nonviolent power. The authorities think they will win with the power of violence. But in the end, they will show the power of violence to be brittle and small. In holding up Jesus for ridicule, the violent powers of the world expose themselves as ultimately powerless. For the true power of Israel's God is made perfect in weakness, and Easter is coming. Jesus inverts George R. R. Martin's riddle about power. The riddle assumes the one who kills or the one who orders the killing is the powerful person. But Jesus shows us that the one choosing to be killed is the one with power. On Palm Sunday, Jesus begins a new exodus and a new liberation by descending the Mount of Olives, by going forward in nonviolence, by moving through death with the trust that God will bring new life. God's power isn't in the sword. Instead, God's power is with the one who rides a donkey to death and resurrection. God's power is in the poor people following Jesus down the mountain. God's power is in us finding our only comfort in life and in death belonging to the crucified one. The call to follow Jesus in this dangerous and violent world is often overwhelming. I know, for me, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is complicating my understanding of how we ought to live. I find myself cheering, understandably, for those Ukrainians bravely resisting a more powerful military force, and yet I'm still troubled by the reality of violence meeting violence. Is there a better way? I don't want to be naive about this world. I also don't want to dismiss the path of the donkey rider who shows us the smallness and brittleness of any power derived from violence. I want to join the psalmist in saying, some take pride in chariots, some in horses, but our pride is in the name of our Lord God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Over the years, We Christ followers have talked about pacifism, and we've talked about just war, and I don't know that we've got it figured out yet. I don't think we've been able to solve the riddle of power for ourselves or for others. But we can continue to witness the truth about Jesus riding that donkey downhill. We can recognize that even if a war can possibly be just, it is also always a tragedy. And we can tell of the power at work in this world that is greater than the power of violence. How do we limp forward toward witnessing that truth in a violent world? I read that during the Cold War, human rights activists promoted living in the truth as an antidote to authoritarian regimes' culture of lies. There is liberating power in seeing things as they are. One effort to live in the truth was an underground publishing effort by the Catholic Church in Lithuania. The Soviet Union absorbed Lithuania in 1944 and attempted to repress the Lithuanians' national identity. Parishes and monasteries were closed. Priests could not catechize, bring the sacraments to the sick, or do anything outside of the churchyard. Pilgrimage sites were destroyed, and propaganda was a staple of state school curriculum. Courageous clergy and laity organized resistance to this oppression. They worked with a clandestine editorial team to create the Chronicle of the Catholic Church in Lithuania. The Chronicle described the harassment and persecution suffered by the Lithuanians. It appealed to Soviet authorities for justice. It served as a safe deposit box for the memory of Lithuanians. Tyrants then and now cannot tolerate the truth because it is a power beyond their control. 
Pope John Paul was once asked, suppose the entire Bible were destroyed. What one sentence or phrase would you want preserved for humanity's future? He didn't hesitate. The truth will make you free. Friends, in this world where people push themselves up with the power of violence, may we follow the one whose power descends in love. May we confront injustice by creating action dilemmas that make room for liberation. And may we embrace the power of truth to set us free in Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of your word and your spirit. We thank you that you are with us at all times, in times of peace and in times of war. God, we pray for your reign to more fully come so that justice flows over this entire world, so that your shalom may be known by everyone everywhere. God, have mercy on all of us as we live in troubled times. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response is number 135 in our green books. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing Friends in Faith. you to be seated. After our great prayer of thanksgiving, we'll be invited to come to the table beginning in the front rows and using the center aisles. We're going to try a new plan today. So we'll receive a piece of gluten-free bread from the server who will use tongs to place the bread in your hands. I'll ask you to eat the bread right up here and then use your own fingers to take a cup of juice and drink and place the empty cup back into the serving tray. So this is what we're trying today, and we'll see how it goes going from here. Um, if you prefer, there are prepackaged communion kits up front that are extra sanitary. Also, if you wish to remain in your seat, you can raise a hand, and a server will bring the elements to you as well. Let's begin our great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give, give our thanks, thanks and praise. God of holy abundance, your love never runs out, your hope never runs dry, your joy never gives up. 
In a world that loves scarcity, your abundance is shocking. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending your son, Jesus Christ, into the world that we might taste and see that you are good. And so with your whole church on earth and all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. of holy abundance, you summon all who hunger and thirst to come and be satisfied. Bless this bread and cup that they may be for us the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, who on the same night in which he gave himself for us took bread, gave thanks to you and broke the bread. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had eaten, Christ took the cup. And he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of the faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restore our life. Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. of holy abundance. You fill us to the brim with your grace. May this eternal food nourish us through times of uncertainty and fear, that we might share your bread of life and cup of salvation. Make us, your church, a fountain of your living water until the day when hunger and thirst are no more, and we live your life abundant together with the communion of saints. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Christ's body was broken for us on the cross. Christ, Christ is the bread, bread of, of life. life. Christ's blood was shed for our forgiveness. Christ is the cup of our salvation. These are the gifts of God. For the people of God. Let us come for all things are now ready.
Having been fed by God's word and at God's table, let us pray a prayer of gratitude and intercession. Throughout the prayer this morning, I will say the stone that the builders rejected and you are invited to respond has become the chief cornerstone. Those words are also in your order of worship. Let's pray together. Holy Trinity, we give you thanks for the great deeds of salvation that you have done and continue to do. In our gratitude, we give you our offerings of thanksgiving, that they may further your work in your world. God in the highest, you came to us in a human being who humbled himself like a slave. In humility, you revealed your servant heart, and in death and resurrection, you revealed your victory. We praise you, O God, for the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. We pray for the nations, O God, nations that so often worship power and might. May they be ruled instead by humility and peace. For the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. We pray, O oh God, for our city, our community, in the wake of Patrick Loyola's death on Monday. May his family have space to grieve and to heal. May the Grand Rapids Police Department pursue justice and reconciliation. And may our city become a place of welcome and safety for all people. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. We pray for your church and her leaders, that we may have the heart and mind of Christ. For the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. We pray for those who are in prison, for the repentant and the unrepentant, and for those falsely accused. May they be made whole and set free. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. We pray for those who are ill, who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those who are battling with the difficulties of aging. We pray for those who are rejected because they are seen to be weak. May they find healing and know they are treasured in your sight. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. God of compassion, in Jesus Christ, you have come to us and shared our common fate. Mold us into people who show your mercy and keep us obedient to the one whose name is above all other names, in whose name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit as we sing our song of sending, I have decided to follow Jesus. You can find that in your order of worship. Thank you.
reminder, in about 10 minutes, we'll start our congregational meeting directly below us in the fellowship hall. The meeting will take about 20, 25 minutes overall. If you are a child and don't want to go to that meeting, there will be a video in the youth room, so you can go to that after the service today. As we go from this place to live following Jesus, we go with God's blessing. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.